Welcome back on the road to the Gumpler Builders World Cup. This is episode 15 and today I'm showing you how I completed the base of my 2017 Gumpler Builders World Cup diorama. Keep in mind, this has all been a learning experience for me, so if I've gone a complete roundabout way to get things done, let me know and I'm happy to take on anyone's suggestions. If you are new to my channel, great to have you here, but you might be a bit confused about the format. I started off this series as a way to document my progress from being a beginner Gumpler builder to creating a competitive diorama to show you guys that you don't need to have years of experience to create something amazing and that there's no right way to get things done. In my previous video, I have already gone over how to make the realistic and 2D rocks for my diorama. So if you want more details, go check that out. So preface this whole thing, I did make mistakes while creating the base, especially while painting. So I would recommend watching this whole video before attempting it yourself. And why do I keep the mistakes in? Really, it's to show you guys that it's okay to make mistakes to stop you from doing the same thing I did and to give you an idea of how I get to my end result. To make the base, you will need these items, which of course can be substituted for other things. You can use different brands and you may not even need everything I used if you're making something similar. All the items will be in the description below, but prices may vary depending on where you live. First off, you'll need a wood base. I got this from Melbourne Artist Supplies, but you could make one of your own if needed. This one is a 40 centimeter by 40 centimeter frame, and I added a paper guide around it to measure out the 50 by 50 competition limit. You're gonna need some extra wood. This is used as reinforcement for the TV mechanism in my model, which will be shown in a future video, so it may not be necessary for you, but it's a good idea to think whether you need this type of thing in your diorama now rather than later. Foam board. This is North insulation from Bunnings Warehouse. If you buy a big sheet of it, it's gonna last you a very, very, very long time. Gorilla Glue, also bought from Bunnings Warehouse. You can use a different type of brand if you want, or really any other type of foam safe glue. A metal scraper, which is definitely optional, but I use this to spread out my Gorilla Glue, but you could really use anything to spread the glue out. Weights, or you could use really anything heavy, maybe fill up some bottles with water, or use those books on your bookshelf that you've never read, but you've owned since high school. I swear, I'll read them eventually. A non-serrated knife or just something sharp to cut the foam with. A wire brush comes in handy for many different things, but in this instance, I used it to rough up the foam. Sculptor mold, which is a very fine paper pulp mixture, acts sort of like paper mache. I did use the kids paper mache mixture in my testing video, but it's not as nice as sculptor mold. So I would suggest ordering some of this in and ordering it in bulk so you don't waste that whole shipping cost. Water, because we always need water to make our dioramas and basically live life. So go get some of that. Our usual container and mixing utensils. The realistic and 2D plus rocks. Again, you can watch my previous video to see how I made these. Water-based paints. I use the Vallejo brand and thank you, Patrick, for correcting me on my very Oka Australian pronunciation when I said Vallejo instead of Vallejo. A variety of brushes. I had some large ones uh, for working with the glue as well as some small ones for hand painting. Matte Mod Podge, which is a type of matte PVA glue used to set scenery in place. If you can't find this, you can also find other setting glues from like hobby shops, or you might be able to get away with just another PVA glue. Keep in mind though, another PVA glue won't set matte, it'll set shiny. So you might have to look around for a different solution. A spray bottle for our Mod Podge mixture. Uh, dishwashing liquid, any brand will do. Different size ballast to simulate dirt. I bought this Matt's ballast from Brunel Hobbies as it's cheaper than the Woodland Scenics ballast, but I'm sure there are other options as well you could use. Or you could definitely use dirt from the garden, but I would sift it through and throw it in the oven to kill off anything that might grow and dry the hell out of it. 
pastels. I chose these warm tone pastels from this set, so reds and browns. It's easy having a set around because you have the choice of all the colors and you'll eventually get to know which ones you use most to only buy those later on. So I'd recommend just this because it's cheap and why not? A straw used to help apply the ballast and isopropyl alcohol. I bought mine from Bunnings Warehouse, but apparently it's cheaper from JCAR here in Australia. So just wherever you can buy it cheap because these bottles were tiny and I used quite a lot of it. So, you know, do whatever works for you. Step one, measure the wood to fit inside the frame and cut it out. I put mine specifically more to one side than in the middle because my TV would angle into it and I needed to drill into the wood. You could also get away with building a wood structure around your foam piece rather than buying the frame. The reason for the structure though is to help your foam board from warping. So really whatever works for you, what's more convenient or what's the most cost effective. Step two, using the base as a guide, cut out the foam to the same size. This foam is actually pretty nice to work with. Just score the top with a blade or a hobby knife and use the edge of the table and hit that foam hard and it will break cleanly. Or if you're weak like me, nothing will happen and you have to get your partner to do it. This is much easier than trying to cut it with a knife. Trust me, I tried. So just break the pieces off. Unless you need to make a circle, then cut that really tediously. Step three. Using the Gorilla Glue, glue down the wood and the foam base. Keep in mind, you don't need to use a lot of Gorilla Glue, just a very thin layer. So I would suggest dotting some on and using a scrap piece of plow plate or the metal scraper to spread it. Make sure to weigh down the base while it is drying as the Gorilla Glue expands into this kind of foamy substance and it will cause your foam board to shift. I used some weights that we had around the house as well as some bottles filled with water. Really, anything heavy will do, even books. And leave it to dry for at least a few hours, preferably overnight, but if you're like me, I generally can't wait overnight because I just wanna keep touching things and making things and yeah, I really only have one day to do things out of the week, so you're gonna get it done on that day. Step four. This is the part where your design will start differing from mine, but you can now use more of that foam to bulk out your base. I attempted to make this hill type of structure with mine, double checking along the way that the TV would still sit in it properly so that it could easily be taken off the model. Again, in a future video, I'll go over how this whole modular aspect of the TV works. Just make sure to keep any of the scraps of foam that you have because they come in handy for future projects. Step five. Once I'd roughed out the foam pieces, it was time to start cutting in some more detail. However, I didn't want to commit to the pieces yet, so instead of gluing them and then cutting them down, I decided to use skewers to hold the pieces in place while using a knife to cut away the foam. By the way, this is a super messy job and you can easily slip and cut yourself, so be careful. Or give your blood sacrifice to the Gumball Gods early, whatever suits your needs. Step six. Now that everything is cut to shape, it's time to glue it all into place. When gluing foam to foam, you should scratch it up with one of these wire brushes, lightly wet the surface, and then glue down with Gorilla Glue, again, weighing it as it dries. Step seven. At this point, you should have already made the rocks, so we're gonna use these plus the sculptor mold to create the rocky terrain. To make the sculptor mold is really easy. You mix water with the powder mixture. It does say two parts sculptor mold to one part water. However, this ends up kind of being thick and lumpy in consistency. So I would start here and add more water if needed. If you want something very smooth, which in hindsight I should have done in the 2D area of my model, then definitely add more water. From memory as a teenager using this stuff in school, we also added some PVA glue to the mixture. I didn't in this instance, but it may help to smooth things out more or maybe even dry quicker. I'll have to test that out at some point in a future video, but something for you to keep in mind. It says it sets in 30 minutes, but you can work with this for a pretty long time from my use with it. And you can come back to it when it's kind of semi-dried and use some water on your fingers to smooth it out even more. So it's pretty versatile. As you can see, I am choosing some of the longer, thinner, realistic rocks for the cliff side of this area and attaching them with the sculptor mold mixture. 
I use the mixture to also fill in between the rocks so they blend nicely. I kind of made this part up as I went along and slowly stopped adding rocks as I got closer to the 2D area of my model. I also put the TV in temporarily so I could build up the rock and dirt mounds around it. So when it's placed on the model, you cannot see the poles holding it in place. I let these areas semi dry before removing the TV, which also allowed the TV to not get stuck, but allowed a gap to be left behind where it should be placed. Once I got to the 2D area, I placed down some of the 2D rocks, leaving some space between these and the realistic where dirt texture would just go. If I were to redo this area, I would definitely smooth out the sculptor mold a lot more while it was wet. However, I do kind of fix this later on in the video with glue, and I also attempted to smooth it down a bit more with sandpaper, which kind of works a bit. Step eight, it's now time to paint the terrain. I've already shown you in my last video how I painted the rocks with the washes using the Vallejo water-based paints, but I didn't go into detail about the rest of the terrain. First off, I was stupid and used some of the cheap Montmartre water-based paints to paint in between the rocks, which is very, 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 very time consuming to hand paint. And you can miss a lot of areas on the rocks and the terrain. I chose these paints to not waste my Vallejo, which is smart as the dirt texture is just gonna go on top of it anyway, but it did look really odd without the dirt. I then hand painted the 2D rocks with the Vallejo Dark Earth, which was actually fine. But like I said in my previous video, it was really easy to chip the paint off. So I redid it and primed the rocks first before painting them again. As you can see, it took a long time to hand paint all the washes of Dark Earth, but if I could recommend something, if you have an airbrush, then airbrush on the main color first to cover everything and then go in with hand painting. It will save you so much time. I wasted so many days on this phase, it is not even funny. So after the mishaps with the rocks and needing to prime them, I airbrushed on the dark earth to cover the rocks as well as the terrain so it was all the same to start off with. And then I airbrushed on some of the Vallejo Panzer Aces Shadows Flesh to keep the warm tones going through the dirt area. Step nine, once you have your color down, it's time to make the dirt. As I said before, you can use actual dirt. However, I've decided to use two different size ballasts to simulate it. The ballast starts off grey, so to make the colouring the same as that warm terrain, I cut up some red and brown pastels and mix them into the finer of the two ballasts first. I started off shaving them, but instead turned to crushing the pastels as it was much faster. Step 10. Now that we have the dirt texture, we need to glue it on. And we do this with the matte Mod Podge solution. So mix into a spray bottle one part Mod Podge to three parts water and add in a drop of detergent. A few more drops if you're going to make a large batch. Something to keep in mind though, I found that the mixture would clog certain spray bottles, so you need one of those larger ones that has that fine mist spray attachment. Use a paintbrush to wet the areas with the mixture and add the dirt texture on top. For those hard to reach areas like the sides, use the straw to blow the ballast onto your model. You can also use the straw to blow away any extra ballast you don't want from different areas. Once the ballast is all on, in sections, wet the area with the isopropyl alcohol. Water can be substituted with this and then spray on more of the Mod Podge mixture. The isopropyl alcohol helps the mixture penetrate all layers of the ballast. So when it's dried, it should all be glued in place. You want the ballast to be wet with the glue mixture, but you don't want any cooling as this creates dark areas or shiny patches on your model. However, if this does happen, it can be fixed up later with some dusting of pastel if needed. We do the exact same thing with the large ballast, adding the pastel coloring and putting it on the model. However, this time choose key areas where you want the dirt to go and where it might be a bit more rocky. I chose areas closer to other rocks slopes on my model as well as where the TV crashed into my model. So instead of adding glue first, I added the ballast to the areas of the model, shaping it with a dry brush and then generously spraying with isopropyl alcohol and using an eyedropper instead of the spray bottle to add the Mod Podge solution. This gives you way more control. Step 11. It took me a while to figure out what I was going to do with the 2D rock area, but after about three goes of airbrushing and hand painting it, I decided to smooth out the sculptor mold by adding a thick layer of full strength Mod Podge. You just have to wait a while for it to dry. 
Once it had, it took a couple of layers of airbrushing on the main red color, and then I hand painted on 2D shadowing on the rocks and the terrain. I used my lamp as the light source, and as the rocks got closer to the realistic area, I airbrushed on the shadowing and highlights. It's not exactly how I expected it to turn out, but it does look pretty cool, and in future, as I said in a previous video, I might try and recreate this terrain. Step 12, the last thing that is needed for this terrain is some highlighting and you can also add in some more colour to the ballast if needed or even cover up any of those dark patches where you added too much glue. This is done by crushing more pastels and lightly dusting them with a dry brush over the terrain. And that's it, that's the craziness I went through to make this model. It may be a bit confusing and all over the place, but it came out looking cool. So hopefully you can make your own rocky terrain now or even something similar. If you ever do, send me a pic. I would love to see what you guys make. And that's the end of this video, guys. If you liked it, then give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so you can be notified about my future videos. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat at Tanasha Builds where you can see all the other crazy my life goes through. I'll see you guys on the next episode on the road to the Gumpler Builders World Cup.